I got him. Yeah. yeah.
morning, everyone. My name is uh, Father John Jaska. I'm pastor of St. George Parish here in London. And uh, on behalf of the entire parish, we want to extend to family and friends of Isabella, or better known Bella, uh, our prayers and condolences as we gather together this morning to celebrate her life, to commend her to God, and to be a people of hope, knowing that she is in the kingdom and that we will join her at the end of our earthly pilgrimage. So as we gather together this morning, we're going to have a chance to, um, to remember, to give thanks, and to look forward in hope. Uh, that's the gift of our faith, and um, the great gift, too, of us gathered together as one family, that we support one another uh, during this most difficult time. For us to begin our celebration, I'm going to invite everyone to please stand. We're going to sing. And Sister Loretta in the seminary taught me saying, you sing better when you stand. So it didn't help me, but uh, I will try. We're going to be singing This Day God Gives Me as our opening song. I uh, found it in the sheets uh, and uh, we'll ask the Lord to bless us on this day as we gather to be strengthened by his love. God gives me strength of high heaven, sun and moon shining, flame in my heart, flashing of lightning, wind in its swiftness, deeps of the ocean, firmness of earth. This day God sends me strength as my steersman, might to uphold me, wisdom as God. Your eyes are watchful, your ears are listening, your lips are speaking, friend at my side. God's way is my way, God's shield is round me. God's host defends me, saving from ill. Angels of heaven drive from me always. All that would harm me, stand by me still. Rising, I thank you, mighty and strong one, King of creation, giver of rest, firmly confessing threeness of person. Oneness of God and Trinity blessed. I'm going to invite everyone to please be seated. We did well. We did well. I don't know. Saint Augustine said, uh, "You know, you sing, you pray twice. Mine is, you sing poorly, you pray three times. So, but you did really well." As difficult as a loss is, it's, it's good to be together, it's good to smile, it's good to remember the blessings, the graces that Bella has been in our lives. The opportunities that we have shared with her, um, the way she has strengthened and loved us and the way we have loved her. So this morning, as an opportunity of remembrance, we're going to have two um, reflections. 
And I'm going to invite uh, Bella's, uh, one of Bella's uh, granddaughters, Natalie, to come forward to share some words. Penny over and a penny back. Um, anyone who knew grandma would have heard that story many times. <laughs> We'd often hear it many times in the same conversation. <laughs> uh, when grandma was a little girl in Wexford, she'd take the ferry over to the beach for one penny to get over and one penny to get back. At some point, someone built a sweet shop and she would usually spend the second penny on candy, <laughs> um, having a sweet tooth. <laughs> And then she would have to walk all the way back. Uh, she knew that if you want something sweet in life, it's worth going the extra mile, literally. Grandma kept her sweet tooth for her whole life and passed it down to her children and grandchildren. Erin and I would love watching Chicken Run over at her house um, with her. We could always persuade her to give us ice cream for lunch, <laughs> usually pralines and cream. <laughs> We tried teaching her French once. Uh, if we taught her the alphabet by sounding out all the letters, usually by the end of the visit, she would learn it pretty well. Um, and then the next visit, we would teach her all over again. <laughs> Grandma loved to learn. Um, every time we visit, she asks us if we like school. And she would always say, it must be awful for those kids that don't love school. Uh, she loved learning. She loved music, and that was something that stayed with her for her whole life. She used to sing in church. Um, we'd go when we were little, and Erin thought she was a celebrity. <laughs> Even as she got more and more confused later in life, she would always sing to herself. Um, she didn't always know who we were, but she was always happy to see us. And Grandma was proof that all you need to live a long and happy life is a loving family, a heart full of music, and lots and lots of sweets. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's a great opportunity to re remember and give thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we have a second um, uh, words of remembrance uh, uh, via video presentation, and that comes from Maureen, uh, daughter of Bella. Today, we're celebrating the life of my mother, Isabella Ann O'Byrne Smith, known for her first 27 years as Bella Byrne and the past 66 as Bella Smith. As Dad would have pointed out, this is the good parts only version. Everyone's life is a saga. Bella's began in 1927 in Wexford, Ireland, where she grew up during the Great Depression and World War II, the oldest of three children. When she was only three, her father left for Canada and after a few letters home was never heard from again. Her mother died when she was 18. Following high school, she became a civil servant and an acting student in Dublin, where she met James Francis Smith. In the mid-50s, they sailed to Canada three days after their wedding. She was seasick the entire voyage. Bella was the first of her siblings and cousins to emigrate to Canada. She and Jim set out alone to make a life. He had no family he was in contact with and hers was an ocean away. Bella was always supportive of Jim's winding career path, moving from Hamilton to Toronto to Peterborough to Port Colborne, finally settling in Windsor, where they lived for 38 years in a house that the entire extended family thought of as home and gathered at regularly. Bella remained a dramatic performer throughout her life. She was always at home on the stage, as an amateur actress in school plays, civic theater performances, and university productions, a lecturer for Weight Watchers, a lay reader at church, a natural storyteller. 
not to mention her performances in the car, clutching the dashboard and gasping, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, whenever I was driving. <laughs> A keen observer of human behavior and an empathetic listener, Bella could talk to anyone and usually did. Some of her grandchildren are thought to have inherited this trait. She could be as annoying as anyone else, maybe more than some. Her younger brother James called her Bella the Boss. She certainly ruled our household. As the years passed, Bella's concern for her grown chicks manifested annoyingly as long-distance calls full of unsolicited advice. But that concern for her chicks was the core of Bella. She loved all of us unconditionally, and that love extended seamlessly to include the family of her sister Betty. Mom told me more than once, I fell in love with you the moment I laid eyes on you, and I've loved you ever since. I know she felt the same about each and every member of the family. Although for the in-laws, there may have been a warming up period. Bella retained her positive outlook throughout her slow decline into Alzheimer's. Her face always lit up for visitors. Certain subjects or a remark that struck a deep chord could often bring a spark of the old Bella to the surface. Like the time I told her my friend was looking for a husband who would take charge of everything, mom's instant reaction was, oh, I wouldn't like that, would you? And just last spring, I reminded her that in Ireland, an old woman is referred to as the old one. But I couldn't remember the term for an old man. Was it Egypt? She paused for a long moment and then said, that's funny. Bella, Bella brought tolerance and humor to all her interactions with others. And that sense of humor she, she instilled in all of us stood us in good stead throughout her decline. We could savor the moments when mom was mom and laugh at the bizarre incongruities that arose from her memory loss. Like the time she scolded me sharply for suggesting dad was in heaven. In my defense, no one had warned me he'd been resurrected. She'd forgotten that he'd died and there was certainly no point in painfully setting her straight. In her last years, we could always reach through mom's fog of Alzheimer's with music. We had grown up with her singing. Do a deer, a female deer, and we are the boys of Wexford on the extremely long two hour drive to Aunt Betty's house in London. Oh, when the saints go marching in, as we trekked along the beach to her favorite spot on Lake Erie. Carols at Christmas, hymns in church, snatches of songs from musicals she acted in, a few lines here and there from songs popular in her youth. Bella played daughter, sister, wife, mother, aunt, grandmother, great-grandmother, friend, and many other roles throughout her life a life of loving and singing, laughing and crying, living and dying. Let me close with a prayer that she recited almost constantly in her last months, probably one of the earliest she had learned as a child and which had taken on an odd Alzheimer's twist. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit Three and one. One, two, three, Alera. I saw De Valera sitting on his bumberera, <laughs> eating chocolate soldiers. Thank you so much to Maureen. And I was told before the uh, celebration began that we're. We're live streaming this service to her. As long as St. Isidore the farmer, who's the patron saint of the internet, everything goes smoothly. So we do, we do greet Maureen, who is watching with us and praying with us 
uh, couldn't be here. But that's beautiful tributes both from Maureen and from Natalie. So, and I'm sure all of you have different stories and different uh, memories that you cherish. And it's good to share them. And it's good, of course, to hold them close to your heart. That is a gift of Bella to us. So we begin our liturgical celebration of prayer with the sign of our faith in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. My brothers and sisters, we have come together to renew our trust in Christ, who by dying on the cross has freed us from eternal death, and by rising has opened for us the gates of heaven. Let us pray for our sister that she may share in Christ's victory, and let us pray for ourselves that the Lord may grant us the gift of his loving consolation. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your Son, who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant Bella, who has gone to her rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. As we've heard some stories, and I'm sure, of course, we have our own memories, um, one of the things we do as people of faith is we ask for the Lord's grace and wisdom and guidance and support during this time. One of the ways we do that is through a sacred scripture. And so uh, we're going to hear some readings this morning. I'm going to uh, invite Anne Marie to come forward to proclaim our first reading. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We know that when the tent that we live in on earth is folded up, there is a house built by God for us, an everlasting home not made by human hands in the heavens. We are always full of confidence then when we remember that to live in the body means to be exiled from the Lord Going as we do by faith and not by sight, we are full of confidence, I say, and actually want to be exiled from the body and make our home with the Lord. Whether we are living in the body or exiled from it, we are intent on pleasing him. For all the truth about us will be brought out in the law court of Christ, and each of us will get what he deserves for the things he did in the body, good or bad. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the gifts of prayer that we do have in the church as well as the gift of the Psalms and so we're going to be praying a psalm together, and the response for everyone is, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no evil would I fear. You are there with your crook and your staff. With these, you give me comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil. My cup is overflowing. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. 
going to invite Aaron to come forward to proclaim our second reading. Thank you. A reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared now, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, as beautiful as a bride all dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice call from the throne, You see the city? Here God lives among men. He will make his home among them. They shall be his people, and he shall be their God. His name is God with them. He will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more death and no more mourning or sadness. The world of the past is gone. Then the one sitting on the throne spoke. Now I am making the whole of creation new, he said. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water from the well of life, free to anybody who is thirsty. It is the rightful inheritance of the one who provides victorious. I will be his God and he a son to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite everyone to please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the holy gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still and trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If there were not, I should have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And after I've gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am, you may be too. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I invite everyone to please be seated. I'd like to um, thank the um, members of our parish who do outreach ministry at McCormick Home. We have a number of volunteers that uh, help coordinate our monthly mass, but also uh, visit um, the residents a Catholic residence um, at McCormick Home, in addition to Ashwood Manor and Westmont Gardens, uh, and Bella was visited by our team. And we have Mike and Eileen Dutton who are at the back. They help coordinate the ministry at McCormick Home. And I want to thank them and the volunteers uh, who visited her, uh, who brought her to Mass, who uh, prayed with her. Um, they're a huge component of our parish, and really what the role of the parishes are to be a place of love and support and that we're invited to take care of one another. And also uh, a reminder that God's grace and God's love um, cannot be held back and goes beyond anything, even the realities of death. Um, and that's a reminder for us as we gather together this morning, honoring uh, Bella who has been called home to the kingdom and the scriptures will always remind us that there's something more in this life. And yes, in, in one way, it's something that we can't see right now here. You know, but there is this sense uh, and the gift of faith reminds us that there is a hope that is fulfilled. And we're in the Advent season right now, preparing obviously for Christmas. And that Advent season uh, is a time of preparation, but it's also a time of reminder that even going through the difficulties, the challenges, the struggles of our lives, there's something far beyond, almost in a sense, our imagining that God offers to us in the glory of heaven. And we need to be reminded of that often, but in particular uh, during this time of loss. Even St. Paul in the first reading goes as far as to say we want to be exiled from the body. Because he knew that being here on earth, we're in one way connected, but we're also disconnected from God. But when we die, 
we fully enter into his glory. And so he says, you know, this is what we should be looking forward to, which is hard for us to understand a bit, but I think he saw it and he would be encouraging us to remember that's the fulfillment of our lives. Being in the kingdom of heaven where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more illness, no more loss, no more death, but the gift of life. And it's a gift of new life. And so we gather together this morning, um, seeing the beautiful pictures on the television, this, the pictures here, reminders of Bella's life, the joy, the love, the faith that she had. And in one way, a loss that we're not connected with her in the same way, but our faith reminds us that this can also be a celebration, that she's gone home and that we will see her again. And that's the, what the gift of what we're going to be celebrating at Christmas. Just a, a couple of about a couple of weeks ago, Pope Francis was in a town in Italy, and in this town of, of uh, Grecio is the town where the uh, nativity, the crèche, originated from. Saint Francis of Assisi was the first one to kind of set up a nativity set. Maybe you have some of them at home, or you remember making them together at school or different things, and. Uh, uh, St. Francis, when he was traveling, probably uh, coming back from Rome, went into this town and he had already been into the Holy Land. And so he had visited the place of Jesus' birth and in the caves recognized some familiarity. And as a way to ponder God's love, he had set up this nativity or this creche for all the his, him and his brothers and, and people from the town to come and pray at. And Pope Francis wrote an apostolic letter just at the beginning of December while he visited this place. And he, says, he, he said, you know what? It's important for all of us as Christians to make sure that as we celebrate Christmas to have a crash or a nativity scene in our homes. Because he says in that beautiful reality, of course you have the Christmas trees and you have the presents and you have the Christmas lights and uh, you know, the inflatable Santa Claus or snowman. I saw this, the frosty snowman the other day at a, near a friend's house, but it was deflated. So he was kind of down. But we have all those decorations. But of course, the heart of Christmas is the birth of Jesus. And Pope Francis, uh, in the, the letter that he wrote, uh, it's only four pages long, but talked about the importance of the nativity scene and how it reminds us that God will always take care of us that God saves all those who are in need. And he kind of goes through the nativity scene. He says, you know, Jesus was placed in a manger. You know, that's where the livestock would, would feed from. And he says, Jesus feeds us, of course, in the gift of the Eucharist, but he feeds us, he fills us with his love. To the shepherds, you know, we have beautiful images on, on Christmas cards of nice, cute shepherds. They were not very highly respected people in the time of Jesus. They were kind of nomadic. Some of them were criminals. They were poor. And yet they're the first ones to um, come and adore Jesus born. And Pope Francis says that this is a sign that even right at the beginning of God's presence on earth through the incarnation of, of Jesus, that he was reaching out to all those who were in need. To all those kind of on the fringes to those who maybe were forgotten or ignored. And then he talked about the three wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, bearing gifts. And he said, the three wise men represent the fact that sometimes it's a long journey to encounter Jesus. Because of course we know the three wise men came from the Far East. They were foreigners and they traveled a long distance. And Pope was saying that all of us too sometimes take a long journey to encounter Jesus. But when we do encounter him, we're transformed, we're made new. And so Christmas, especially maybe this Christmas, which will for all of us be harder because of Bella's passing. You know, if you don't have a nativity said, go get one or print one off from the internet. But if you do have one, haven't set it up yet, put it out because the gift of Jesus being born, becoming one, one of us, fuses this relationship between God and humanity. And I think it was St. Augustine who originally said it, and Pope Francis echoes it in his letter saying, God became one of us so that we may become like him, that we would live forever. 
And if anything, our faith always reminds us that there is always something more. There always is always something better. And what is that? Eternal life with God. And our faith always pushes us towards that goal. The readings today from Paul's letter about saying, you know what, we should be looking forward to entering into the kingdom. To the second reading from the book of Revelation, this new heaven and new earth to the gospel, where Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And uh, when the time is right, I'm going to come back and take you home. And thank God, Thomas the Apostle asked, where are you going? We don't know the way. Well, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the road to heaven. And he leads us there. So no matter what difficulties, what struggles, what darkness. Pope Francis talks about the surroundings of the nativity scene and even oftentimes it's depicted the nativity scene at night that even in the midst of darkness God's light shines through Jesus. So as we continue in our prayer and we continue in our remembrance of Bella, God is telling us she's gone home. She's set free from her sufferings. She's at peace. And that we too long to see her again when we end our earthly journey. And our life, just like this Advent season, is always that time to prepare, to open our hearts, and to live our lives for others, and in particular, live our lives for Christ. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for his church. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers to his. So I'm going to present some intentions. and At the end of each of the intentions, I'm going to say, we pray to the Lord, and your response is, Lord, hear our prayer. In baptism, Bella received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and lead her over the waters of death. We pray to the Lord. Our sister was nourished at the table of the Savior. Welcome her into the halls of the heavenly banquet. We pray to the Lord. Many friends and family members have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. We pray to the Lord. Many people die by violence, war, and famine each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer unjustly these sins against your love and gather them into the eternal kingdom of peace. We pray to the Lord. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. We pray to the Lord. The family and friends of Bella seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that come from grief. We pray to the Lord. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our sister Bella. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. We pray to the Lord. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of your people, whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in the kingdom. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Longing for the coming of God's kingdom, we now pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Bella, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Bella again and enjoy her friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the 
mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. In baptism, let us share in the death and resurrection of Christ, and she be welcomed to the glory of eternal love. to begin our song. Thank you. 